Tim. Yes, it is great to be here and it's nice to see so many that we can actually talk through some of these issues. I was actually uh, thinking before, there's probably one other uh, comment that will apply to this talk and How's that? Uh, one other comment will apply as much to this talk as pri pri to uh, the pri previous talk, and that will be measure and manage. I think if we summarise it, that would nearly pick up some of those issues because if we can measure the information, we can manage our herd. And I think that applies to Terry's talk in terms of pastures, in terms of a range of things. So just just add that to the 60 days um, to measure and manage what's actually going on. If you don't measure it, how do you manage it? I think. Anyway, coming down to some of these things, I actually put a few slides together. I was given um, some comments in advance as to issues that some were interested in. I also recognise the fact that some out of the group have done a bull selection uh, workshop or day with Roxanne, so I'm conscious of the fact that some will have been exposed to some of my thoughts, comments, but certainly I'm not uh, unashamed of challenging the system. I just put a few thoughts there for those of you that are wondering why bull selection has got into the discussion this afternoon and just to raise some comments for us that and it touches in very well with what Terry said it one of the components is increased efficiency in the grazing system that one opportunity we have as a result of improving our bull selection is improving that efficiency in our system secondly decreased stocking pressure Terry spent a lot of time in relation to talking about the pastures, the soils, the grazing system and, and also uh, he started to finish up with some comments in reproduction so just to reinforce the issue that bull selection uh, does have a vital impact on that issue of stocking pressure for a given level of productivity. And lastly, minimising runoff, maintenance of pasture cover etc um, to meet the breeding objectives. I just put those there without knowing what Terry was going to say, but they do overlap. And so for that reason, I and in within that context, I've put a number of slides together and I think we might skip through a number of them. There's no excuse for that because in a short time we can't do bull selection justice. So I'll try and skip through a few of these ones for us. So to come down to the issues that that were raised to start with, they're the ones that have been mentioned to me uh, as points of interest and that's in relation to making money, uh, points to consider when, in, when selecting traits in a bull, um, the bull breeding soundness evaluation information and I know that's uh, relevant to a number for those of you that got beef herds. How many here have got a beef cattle enterprise as part of their business? So two thirds of the group by and large. Um, then some questions about what drives genetics. Um, we're not referring to the baker when you disappear or the butcher. Um, so what drives the genetics uh, is directly in the decisions we make in the herd. Coming down to some tools we can use and I guess there's always a, an enthusiasm for moving forward. So I've put a few slides in there about where we are going because there are rapid changes available to us. We can choose to ignore them or we can choose to use them. So I just put a few, I've put a few slides in there for that. So primary purpose of the bull and in relation to follow, it's following on from what Terry said but with no intention just to mimic what he said, it's to get maximum cows in calf in a minimum time and that 60 days has been touted. Um, in relation to um, the, uh, what have we done? We lost connec connection. Um, the, uh, uh, in terms of getting the maximum number of cows in calf in a short time and to achieve the uh, productivity in the herd that we're actually looking for, 
because we want to try and achieve not only a shorter term or a more focused mating time, we also want to achieve the transmission of the desirable traits. Uh, that one. Thanks, man. Um, the desirable traits that we're looking for. So we'd like to try and ensure that we transmit all the traits that we're choosing for. How many times have we bought a bull for our herd and not achieved what we're really looking for? Or conversely, have got traits that we're not looking for, undesirable ones. So I guess the issue to us is how do we produce offspring um, with good fertility in a shorter period? The other question is, is how much effect does the bull have on our herd? Are we sure? Have we got any kind of uh, idea? I'll ask a ruder question. How many calves does a bull get in a lifetime? Apart from stuff to I know, what's another reasonable answer? <laughs> as many as he can. Yeah, go to the pubs and you get certainly a different answer to that one. Um, so how many bulls does a, how many calves does a bull get in a lifetime? Just think of the logic for an explanation for that. If you mate one bull to 40 cows, just to pluck a figure out of the air, and you, you're sitting on, Terry used an 80%, so we're at 80% uh, calving rate within a year. Um, that's 32 calves. How many years do you use a bull for? Uh, what's the working life of a bull? Five, three? Where's some honest ones around here? Yeah, I was <laughs> gonna say, I'm, there'll be some that are pushing that out. So, so whatever the case, then three's the average working life of bulls in Australia. If it was five years then, and 32 calves, um, there's 160 calves in a lifetime. How many calves does a cow have in a lifetime? And the dishonest ones will say 10 if they keep it all 10. Um, so at the end of the day, five, eight, 10, whatever the case may be, if we take a middle of the road figure eight, which is probably high because that means that we're mating them younger or keeping them older, um, then by implication, the bull is driving the direction of your herd. No question. You can't argue that one from your own information. So the bull is driving the direction, so let's get the issues in relation to bull selection right. So come down to the issues that we need to. The first comment I will make is set the breeding objectives in your herd. The, bull next, the, the buyer next to you at a sale does not know what you require to make your herd more profitable. So just because Joe Blow at a sale is putting up his hand more frequently, he could have Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. So make sure that you are actually know what you want to achieve in your herd. Set the breeding objectives for your herd. So it, and basically that term picks up the issues about what do you need to change in your herd? Terry's talked about a whole range of things. What do you need to change in your herd? What's the target market saying? What's the requirements in terms of the market outcomes? So there are two things. Within your own herd, what do you need to change? It might be adaptation, it might be uh, temperament, it might be growth, it might be fertility, whatever the case may be. What's your current herd? What's the target market saying? And then what opportunities are there in terms of selection that in bulls that you can buy? So set the breeding objectives. Just take that one home as, a, as an issue. Then come down to the things in, in terms of selection, focusing on the, the fact of fertility. Bearing in mind that fertility is driving the majority of herds first. If you don't have calves on the ground, you can't make them grow, you can't feed them, you can't get all the other benefits that flow on. So the first comment I just want to raise is you need to buy bulls that are reproductively sound. They have to be fertile. To me, a must have. If he's not fertile, you've wasted your time. And it's not price related. Because we know that there have been bulls sold through the Gracemere sale uh, for in excess of several hundred thousand dollars and never got a calf. It is not related to price. So come down to some of the things. I've just raised some issues. They need to be structurally sound. They need to have good sperm production and quality. Do we pay attention to either of those? Down to things like libido and ability to serve, down to the other components in relation to genetic 
fertility traits. Do we use those? They're available and free from reproductive diseases because that was um, a question in Terry's talk. So come down to some of these things and I thought, well, we'll list some of those things and quickly skim through them because today's not about drilling down to the individuals. But I just wanted to summarise a few of them first up front to say most of the industry, and I've done a few of these days over time, most of the industry don't have a discussion or a problem over the traits that are clearly visible. In fact, 80% of the beef industry in Northern Australia focuses on the traits that are clearly visible, e.g. the things we can see. But the but is there's a number of traits that are driving your profitability that are not clearly visible. So the things that go into that, as you can see there, are in terms of the mo stuff that we need some additional information, microscopically assisted. In other words, someone needs to pay attention to look at some aspects pertaining to the fertility of the bull. Some of the things that are genetically defined, so that's in addition also, stuff that we can tell. And lastly, in relation to dam information that each of you generally can look up in advance and know, apart from what's in the sale catalogue, this dam has produced the best calf for the last 50 years, you can actually look it up and see whether she has had a calf every year. Do you want a bull producing calves in your herd that was out of a cow that had a calf every 18 months or two years? So look for the information, measure it, do your homework. So come down to some of the issues and as I said I'll just skip through some of these things, the things that are clearly visible and just as a photo, well then the question is, 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 is that bull fertile? So some would say, I don't know, um, there's a whole range of answers there but at the end of the day the issue is you cannot tell just from looking at the bull. That's what the beef industry by and large uses. And even worse, get an agent to look at it for you. So come down to some of the things that we need to think about. I just want to give you some fact because I said last night to someone I don't shy away from fact and the fact is we looked at a large number of bulls out of a MLA funded um, study across Northern Australia and across a large number of bulls 58% got less than 10% of the calves, 7% didn't get any calves and 13% got greater than 30% of the calves. If you want an average bull you're right in the box seat of getting it with if asking, without asking for information. So just to give you that information you can see that a fair percentage, a normal distribution curve, the bulk of the animals in other words, get less than 10% of the calves. Strangely enough in the beef industry, the ones that are in this other 13% down here, we often get rid of because they pay the neighbours cows a visit and uh, they're hard to manage, so we turf him out. So the reality is let's know what's actually going on in our herd. So come down to some of these issues then. The first comment is no single trait p consistently predicts calf output. You, there is no silver bullets apart from John Wayne and Lone Ranger. So at this stage you cannot hang your hat on any one trait and say fixed it. The next thing is is that a number of traits we know are related to calf output so let's use them. So come down to some of the things. I'll just cover some of the general superficial things that are available in a breeding soundness because that's one of the questions that was raised at the outset by some out of the catchment group that they wanted to discuss. So a breeding, who's heard of a bull breeding sound, I know there's some here, who's heard of a bull breeding soundness evaluation? Now we've narrowed the group down a fair bit. So basically that's raising the issue it's about an examination prior to purchase. I just said to someone this morning out there and you can watch your TV and see the response um, that the question is, is why do you need this information why measure and manage? 
Let me put a vision in your mind. When you fed the cat, or the dog, a tin of that stuff that you had out on the shelf that was all rusty on the outside and the label was gone and you fed it and then the cat spewed up or the dog spewed up. It had no label, no label on the tin. Why shouldn't that same procedure happen when you buy a bull with no information? Your bank balance is going to be the same. You could go anyway. So... And, and, and the challenge I would throw out to most of those male partners that do the shopping, if they were to come home with a shopping trolley full of product without labels on it, how long would you reside in that residence? Not long. Get out and get the right thing. And yet we're prepared to come home with a bull with no information. That drives our herd for the next 10 to 15 years, influences, of, as we just said, 160 calves in a lifetime and in influences the future of the females in the herd. There is no logic in the rubbish we carry on with. So come down to the sorts of things that contribute to a bull breeding soundness evaluation. Things that are, we're happy with, the things in relation to head and eyes, legs, feet, joints, etc. Then down to the sheath and contents. Um, most of that bit, the contents is ignored. Sheath is sometimes looked at. Um, down to scrotum and contents, yes, they look good. Someone said equivalent to two cans, two stubbies. Um, little relevance to what's going on inside and then mating behaviour. So I just put a few slides here for you just to quickly skim through these because I'm not undermining the value of them but I don't want to labour them. So just to go through the things in relation to the physical soundness, um, there's relation to the feet and legs that we can look at from behind, the legs and feet that we can look at from the side. Um, and yes, they are all uh, important. Um, then we come down to the issues about joints, and I see this one over and over again. And like the season, we find all sorts of excuses why joints should be swollen. It's because oh, the ground's too hard or they've been in a feedlot or every other excuse under the sun. Degenerative joint disease happens in this species in the room. It happens in cattle. So breakdown in the joints often is genetic. And I've seen it between the claws um, that superficially just appears as a horny growth but affects semen quality. What connection does it have between the feet and the semen? We can talk about that later. Um, so down to head and eyes, there's a few things that you'd probably be aware of in relation to the head and eyes, in relation to the navel structures. Um, just a quick comment in passing, we did measure 1,500 odd bulls to look at that in relation to calf output. I can say to you that the depth of the sheath from the abdominal wall to the propitial hairline is negatively related to calf output. Deeper the sheath, fewer the calves. Simple. Um, the thickness of the umbilicus or residue of the umbilicus um, that's the bit inside from the, the uh, where the belly button is. Um, the thicker that is, the fewer the calves. So we've looked at that. We don't need to go around making excuses. Um, and in terms of sheath score, yeah, we, we looked at that. And so that information is available. There's one breed, interestingly, last year at a national sale wanted all bulls to be assessed so they could see what was going on and the vendor said we won't do it again we might know what's happening um, so there's a number of issues in relation to and, and pornography always sells so um, a number of issues in relation to the penis and yes there are plenty of abnormalities there they are around the message i want to leave with you is is measure and manage you can't get it after you buy the bull, or you can, you'll see, after the horse is bolted. So we should be asking for the information in advance in a bull breeding soundness evaluation. The veterinarians can provide the certificate with you, and we've got Roxanne here and others. Um, so that sort of information is available. There are, that just says there are a number of abnormalities, and I don't need to go into those in this forum. Down to scrotal circumference and... Yes, that's the bit that a lot of people pay attention to. We know it's related, measured at 12 months, is related to daughter's age of puberty. Yes, that is correct. It's related to daily sperm production and total sperm production in the bull. Yes, 
but it's the output of the testicle that is the piece of information that's missing there. So, yes, we have looked at it in relation to the weight of the bull and there's relationships there. Um, there are various abnormalities that are present, but down to the issues of semen evaluation, yes, we can collect semen, easy, relatively easy process, um, and we can examine it crush side, we can measure it um, by sending it to a lab invariably, um, and what we get is what's called morphology or structural soundness of the semen. And the figure is, I would encourage you to be buying bulls that have greater than 70% normals for matazoa. In other words, you wouldn't buy a bull that was structurally abnormal in the legs and feet. Why would you buy a bull that had abnormal semen? And more importantly, and that's just a shock to just some abnormalities, um, there's plenty around, um, so that's not, not a, a scare tactic. Um, why would you buy a bull with high percentage of abnormal spermatozoa? In, in more important terms, does it have any other effect apart from calf getting ability immediately? Yes. Think about the logic of it. The bull is not only just producing calves, he's producing daughters that carry his traits. And we know from the CRC research that the bull's daughter's fertility, specifically age of puberty, specifically lactational and estrus interval, or postpartum and estrus interval, the time from calving to reconception, is a derivative of the bull's fertility. So we need to start thinking about some of those things. There's some just relationships there. Mating behaviour, yes, we can get some information. We know that that was related to calf output, so there's no surprise. Um, but just come down to some of those relationships. And in relation to the scrotal size at 12 months, for example, as you can see, and composites, Brahmins and composites, there is a relationship to age of puberty. And in relation to the other traits, as you can see there, those behind me will find difficulty. You can see at 12 months, for example, um, negatively related to age of puberty of the daughters. The bull that has higher percent normal at 12 months and ultimately at 18 months has daughters with earlier age of puberty. Do not interpret, and I haven't said, make them younger. What I have said is that those females cycle younger. They are then recipients and ready to be mated when you choose. So the issue is, is the bull that has more fertile daughters will cycle ready for the time of mating that you want. Not you put the bull in and she says, hang on, I'm not ready yet. Take another aspirin. So they're the sorts of things we need to pay attention to in relation to the lactation and estrus interval or postpartum and estrus interval, same term. Um, then we know that there are issues there. In relation to bulls at 18 months of age, there is a negative relationship. In other words, the higher the percent normal, the shorter the time for the daughters from calving to reconception. Terry's talked about that 60 days. If you not don't have bulls in your herd, or conversely said, you're not buying bulls, that have high percent normals for matazoa, you have Buckley's chance of reducing it to 60 days for a while. And what's more, if you keep buying bulls with no information, you'll be all over the show. So there is an issue in relation to reinforcing that early statement, measure and manage. If you want to change the direction of your herd, ask for the information. Don't wait for someone to give it to you on a platter, because they won't. Um, so just to quickly move through a few of the other things, because I'm conscious of time, and I do want to leave you with a few gems about where we're going. There are other factors affecting bull fertility, and Terry started to allude to them in relation to diseases. And yes, there are what Pesty was mentioned, but there's a range of diseases, inclusive of Vibrio, trichomoniasis, Neospora, um, lepto, yeah, so there's a range of those. 
uh, that are there. So down to sexual maturity uh, and their onset of puberty and that's in relation to the genetic defects. So there's just a, a number of them that are there and the intention is not to go into those in detail but to recognise the fact that there are various diseases. Two of them are truly sexually transmitted diseases, the rest of them aren't. So um, uh, we need to be conscious of them and what can we do. So then come down to the other question that was raised, what drives genetics and tools that we can use? So I just wanted to raise a few questions in our minds there because that was a question about, well, can we make some comments on it? There is no doubt it's the genotype of the animal affects their genetic makeup. And at the end of the day, there's environmental factors or phenotype, you read of various words, that are then affecting those non-genetic factors like nutrition, environment, um, etc. And it's the phenotype is what we see and what we can measure, which is a reflection of the genetic makeup of the animal. So we need to get closer to what is the genetic makeup of an animal to influence where we are taking our herd that we can then look after along the lines of what Terry's been talking about in terms of looking after the pasture and ultimately the soil. It's no good having those resources looked after and doing an abysmal job on the livestock. They won't express their, despite the good feed that you'll have available to them. So, you know, it is a, the, what we see is a combination of environment and genetics. So, a few comments about those that are questioning about the genes. Well, I guess we recognise that it's just a small subset, uh, section on the DNA, they influence inheritance because some people are wondering and the question keeps coming up about inheritance and inbreeding and all sorts of things that get raised. Um, it, it's the genes that determine the traits that we have, that we see. So I'm getting down to one step from what we see in the live animal and what we look for. You know, the general terms of smooth, fleshy, straight back, line, you name it, all those sorts of crap. Um, and then we want to come down to what's driving our profitability. So we come down to the various components along the genes and, you know, things like terms that you will hear in relation to the genetics is gene additive gene effects and the distribution and variation of traits and so on, the intensity of your selection. They're the things that some people will need to pay attention to, but I don't intend to spend time in that area. I was just going to raise the issue for those of you that wonder, um, what's the relationship of one trait as opposed to another? We know, and we've got a good handle at this stage, on if we change one trait, how much do we change another? Because the relationships are there, and all this, these couple of slides are up for is to show that if we change a trait to take the very top one, birth weight, it has a significant relationship to 200 day growth. So if we get, if we, for those of you that might want to select for high growth at let's say um, 200 day yearling weight or 600 day, 18 months, 20 months, um, it's going to carry through to birth weight. It's no surprise then if we get a high performing animal there that we're by and large going to drag up birth weight. We're going to end up with calving difficulty. So those relationships are there. All I'm saying with that slide is, is those relationships have been measured and defined. Come down to some of the carcass ones, so it's there. Come down to some of the fertility ones, and it's there. So that information, surprisingly, is behind all animals. The interesting thing is, is if we don't measure it, do we not get it? <laughs> we don't look, we don't have a problem. No, the facts are we're going to get it. So we might as well get what we want in our herd. By ignorance is no excuse. So come down to some of the issues of heritability because that was a question in relation to genetics. What's the impact of heritability? What, what's this term that people talk about heritability? What is it? Apart from stuff divino, is what we get is the proportion of what we get relative to what we see. 
So some people would say, oh, most of what we get is the result of nutrition or feeding or some other sorts of excuses. But the facts are that various traits are different in their heritabilities. Some are more heritable than others and some we can make a lot of progress readily and some are more difficult. So we need to know and be conscious about what is the heritability of the traits to influence ultimately what's going up the loading ramp to where the cash transaction occurs. In relation to how the animals function in our herd, do we get more calves, do we get more in a shorter time or do we have calves spread over the whole 12 months of the year? So how can we change some of those sort of things? So the issue is it's the value of the trait relative in the genotype. That information is available, I'm not going to labour that. And issues in relation to genetic uh, progress, genetic change, well it's the heritability of the trait, it's the variation that's already there that we can utilise in the population. Is there much variation for the traits out there? In the bulls we see, or do you just want someone to feed them for you, stuff them to the eyeballs so you can't see? In the main, people say to me, oh, we don't want them fed. But if they're not fed, they don't pay for them. So do we know what we're really looking for? Um, and then down to issues in relation to the accuracy of selection. Do we really know what we're getting? So come down to some of these issues in relation to the estimated breeding values. Um, and to raise some of the thoughts about, well, is someone swearing at you when they use that term to start with? For those of you that have cattle, and for those of you that breed cattle, and thereby buy bulls, who uses estimated breeding values or genetic differences? Yep, so we're down to a relatively small group again. So what it's saying is, it is basically a genetic estimation of the difference between animals for each individual traits that have been measured that are of economic importance to us. We shouldn't be worrying ourselves about measuring traits that are not economically important. In fact, there are four things that you can take home in relation to that. It is the trait must be heritable for your selection. If it's not heritable, why are you investing one cent in the trait? Do many people invest money in non-heritable traits? <laughs> I know some don't, but I know there's a heap that do here without knowing any of your businesses. Because when they're fed, it ends up a shit in the paddock, another technical term of Terry's. Um, and that is not heritable. If it's not passed on from the sire and what you see to the daughters in the female line or to the males, to the progeny, you are not getting a financial return out of the exercise. The basis of the beef industry by and large is feed them to the eyeballs, they look good, and feeding is not heritable. So that's the first comment, it needs to be measurable. If the trait's not measurable, how do you know which one's better than another one? Apart from looks, and looks hasn't got us a long way in the industry. So if it's not able to be measured, how do you know? If it's not of economic importance, if you're not getting paid for it, why are you doing it? And if there's not variation in the trait, you can't select a better or worse animal. So those four things are a good rule of thumb that can be overlaid across selection. So come down to some of these EBVs that are available. There's a range of EBVs there for us to use in relation to growth traits, from birth weight, the 200-day milk growth, the 200-day growth or weaning weight, yearling weight, final weight, and there is a car mature cow weight, there is a carcass weight, there's fertility traits, and again, they're important to us because they're going to influence calving ease, the gestation length. Um, gestation length, any importance to us? Yes. More time in the cooker means? Le less time to rebreed and? 
bigger calves. Yes. So you lose the heifer, dead, or you pay someone to do a Caesar. So at the end of the day, yes, it's important days to calving. That's the time from when the cow calves to when she goes back in calf again. Is it important to us? Yes, because that comment of that 60 days, we shouldn't have to wean to get cows in calf, should we? They should be in calf prior to weaning. So that's another issue to take home. Shorter days to calving is more profitable to us as breeders, commercial breeders. Scrotal size has an impact in relation to heifers' age of puberty. Then there's a range of carcass traits, and yes, they're important, and yes, they by and large are related to the price we receive or the suitability to market specifications. Yes, so there's a number there. And I just took a snapshot out of a herd just to highlight the fact that um, I could go in there like anyone else, that's a Brahmin herd, I could go in there like anyone else and get all the information prior to the sale. It's available to each and every one here at no cost to be able to do your homework and go looking for the information. The data is there and able to be used to drive the profitability of your herd. So. Yes, it's there, and I just did that just the other day, just for here, just as a, an issue to see what sort of information is out there, freely available for each and every one that's out in the market of buying bulls. Um, coming down to the issues about where to from here, because that's the bit that I thought, well, you know, y some people have heard this over and over again, so I'm trying to cater for some in this group that, have been there, done that, they're sick of hearing me, um, and want to know some of the opportunities as to where we could be going. So down to the issue of transitioning from estimated breeding values to the genomic breeding values, because that's the bit that some people think, well, genomics is going to do solve the world's problems. Um, we're begging for some of the genomic information in, in the human medicine world for Alzheimer's. Those who are like me, you might get at some stage in the near future, shorter term than later term. Uh, <laughs> and a range of other traits, heart disease, etc., etc. So, you know, genomic information is definitely coming. Has anyone supplied any genetic material to any government organisation? One? Hey? Blood? Yeah, I would have thought there's quite a few in this room have actually supplied genetic material. Hey? Have ever been called up for a random breath test? <laughs> what did they do with the sample? Did you follow it through? <laughs> Stuff if I know, but I do know that what you did is you put a bit of saliva on a white tube, and that bit of saliva carries your DNA. The interesting thing I did a day with the forensic group from New South Wales and they actually said that we get most of our hits off DNA. And you know how you get it? Simple. Give someone a stubby to drink for a while and swap the bottles or give them a cigarette and take the cigarette butt. You've got it. Simple to get DNA. I'm asking you the question where is this whole area of DNA going? Because it's the genomic information. So for that reason, I thought, well, this will whet the appetite a little bit for what's actually happening. I put in a few slides. So down to the current, for those of you that use estimated breeding values, that's in relation to the performance or the pedigree information, the performance of the individual animal um, to give us estimated breeding values, which are an estimation of the breeding value for each of the traits that are actually used at present. So it's down to the issues of what is DNA and it's in all animals, in all tissue, deoxyribonucleic acid for those that are wondering, uh, in all tissue samples in the body. Uh, it's the blueprint for life, it's in all cells. Um, and currently in the industry we tend to use um, hair follicles. In other words, it's easy to pull a bit of tar there, from the, obviously from the tar. Um, 
don't cut it out, don't cut it off. You just pull it and you get the follicle and that's all that they need. They can put it in storage, stays there for years um, and they can use that information. We can get it from calves. In fact, there is one herd in Queensland. What age do you think they are getting DNA for sampling those animals? Day eight old embryos. We are doing it now. It's not pie in the sky, it's happening. So that's the stage at which we can start to progress. So I just highlighted the fact that in DNA, where we went or where we were, we started with microsatellites with 36 markers, but up to 36. When I first started some of the bull power research, we started with three uh, since 1990, and the progression has been so rapid in that time. Um, but now we're actually using single nucleotide polymorphisms or groups of markers um, and at the end of the day we have markers for 10, 15, 18, 50, 800 Ks. That's happening around Queensland. There's currently a project um, run by Ben Hayes with 30,000 animals that they're using some taking DNA from to look at the performance of those animals. So that's, that's a here and now, that's, that's actually happening. Um, but I just wanted to highlight the fact of where to, where are we moving to with all this sort of information? Because currently we now have the DNA and the, and it's based on those SNPs on the low density chip, the 50k or 800k chip, being added to the estimated breeding values to produce, and it's what they call a single step prediction equation for genomic breeding values. That's where we're going. Has any breeds got it in place yet? Yes. Brahman, Hereford, Angus and Wagyu's are the current ones in place with it using DNA in association with the phenotypic measures. So it's there. So what is this sort of stuff, stuff it is? Tell us. Well, the interesting thing is I just wanted to put out some facts before people run away with a perceived silver bullet. The facts are the accuracy of information or genomic breeding values is highest earlier in life where we can't measure the other uh, phenotypic differences. For example, let's take a 200 day growth or 400 day growth. As the animal gets older and it grows out to weaning, then it grows to yearling, goes to 600 day, to 20 months or whatever, as we measure those traits, the benefit we get out of genomic information decreases. But the benefit is greatest early in life for hard to measure traits. But yes, we have some of that information currently available because there are some people that think they will just use genomic information, they won't need to do anything else. And you could be some in the room in that category. At the end of the day, the only way you can get a variable measure out of a genomic piece of information is because someone has measured the phenotype and related it to those differences. So just to highlight to you, for those of you that are wondering where are we going in the industry, all I've put that up there for is not scare text to tactics, just to say that from a little hair sample of an animal, we can tell its breed composition, like that. And so we now have that information available to be fed into the uh, single step prediction equation for the genomic breeding values. And what is interesting, you can see there that this is the Brahmin sitting out here. They're the Angus, they're Murray Greys, they're Herefords and so on, they're Shorthorn. Um, and then you've got Tropical, compos tropical composites here. You've got sander and drought masters in here. Um, the various breeds sit in, by and large, clusters. Why are they clusters? Why aren't they discrete points? Why should there be a spread? <coughs> less and less breeding in the center. Not uh, said another way, out of dishonesty. <laughs> Because we say it's X, Y, Z, you know that there's two Brahmins in the current bin that are not Brahmin. <laughs> they got something else in there. Um, 
The issue is, is we can see where they sit relative to the gene pool. And it's, it's interesting that therein lies this issue, well, why the Sanders and Drought Masters sit in here, because there's overlap between the two genotypes. Do we accept that? Yeah. Five, eight, three, eight. Brahman. Short on. So therein is the, the issue. And in terms of the tropical composites that are there, here, um, why are they scattered like that? By and large, they got a bit of Brahman in them and a bit of some of the other breeds, whether it be short on or whatever the case, whatever the composite is. So it's just raising an issue that the genomic information that is occurring, has occurred, is occurring, at present, is known. It's a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling to put in on a pedigree form who we think is the sire and who we think is the dam because it satisfies us. We can tell. So straight off the current snips, we can tell who the sire is and who the dam is without having to mother up. So that sort of information is now out there. The only proviso I'll make to that statement is we need to know who the possible sires are and obviously who the possible dams are in the herd. And obviously we need DNA of the calf in question or calves across the whole herd. So um, that information is there and the re as I said the reason I put that there is just for an example to us about what's actually happening. So can we find the genes? The next question is, is if I get a piece of DNA and put it in, can I tell the performance for a suite of traits of this animal? Genomic information just gives an output just like that. That's just one piece of information in relation to hip-hop on chromosome 14. Um, but at the end of the day, it doesn't say that it will be um, 140 uh, centimetres high, it'll be 120 or whatever the case may be. It comes with a spike off the scan of the genomic analysis for the SNPs. It does not tell us a variable measure that's an economic trait that we use in our herd. So therefore it is implied that we will have to measure traits for quite a number of years to come. We will need to obtain DNA of those animals and relate the genomic information with the phenotype to still benefit for those other people in the industry that are just using genomic information. The message is don't have a comfortable feeling to think I can just get DNA and I've solved all the problems in my herd. We will need the combination of the two for years to come and it will come at the expense of those producers that currently collect both pieces of information. So that's just a, a little piece of information about where we're going. So coming down to the fact of the whole prediction equations and where are we moving along with these uh, SNPs. Well, we're moving rapidly into the single step with genomic breeding values. Um, we are, have ongoing projects. As I said, Ben Hayes has got 30 odd thousand animals across Queensland where genomic data is being measured and measured various measures of performance on herd are being done. Um, and the information is collected in the lab. Um, there are various labs around, but there used to be the animal genetics lab at the University of Queensland. It's been bought out by Sigen and and now it's just recently changed its name. They're an American company based at the University of Queensland that do most of the analysis for us, but there are labs elsewhere around Australia. There's one out of operating out of Victoria, one operating out of the um, University in Adelaide. So these places are fully functional at this stage. Cost-wise, in terms of for DNA uh, 50k SNPs, about $45 a sample. Um, relatively cheap in the, in the real terms, in terms of the information we, we are getting. But yes, it is happening. So that's a, a fact of life. So then the question is, is where to from here? Well, the question was asked either last night or sometime about the fact that um, 
we are plagued in the beef industry by what's our notable issue that we have the single difference between us in the beef industry and the pig, poultry, uh, sheep industries? What's the single difference? Yes? Grass fed as opposed to caged or, or fed? Yeah, what else? Speed of genetic gain? Yeah, what else? How many breed societies can we list off for the chooks and pigs and, and uh, sheep? How many in the cattle industry? <laughs> There's parasites around everywhere in there. So um, the reality is that we have individuals and groups of organisations that are there that are intermediates in terms of the production system. So the reality is we are moving faster towards a single multi-breed analysis in the beef industry. The intention is from MLA's level at this stage to put us into a single analysis that will pick up all genotypes. Because you don't look in the pig industry for any of those producing pork and you don't read, are there breed societies? Yes. They're there for the show people and the, the people who just want to have a fancy chook or a fancy pig or something. There's, there's our pigs there and there are chooks for those in the shows that want to just identify that this is a XYZ uh, breed. But at the end of the day, the commercial pig, poultry and sheep producers are now moving and have moved a long way from breeds to a, an across-breed analysis. Why are we still perpetuating breed? So yes, some animals will have genetic traits that we are looking for. Let's know about it and let's be able to compare them with others. So I'm just putting out the challenge to us because this is a good forum to throw out some challenges. Um, why don't we start thinking about what is going to drive my business into the future? Can I select an animal independent of breed that will change my profitability in my herd? Because currently we are locked into a within breed analysis. So that's an area that we are moving towards. There is absolutely no doubt about that one. And MLA, as I said, are intent to put us into a position along the lines of those other uh, protein industries where they are not functioning on a breed base, they are functioning on a performance base independent of breed. So I just put that one out there because it is happening, it's there, and we currently have a tropical analysis, composite analysis as it's called, currently that has a number of herds in it for that very reason, as the start. So it's just raising some issues for you to think about, well, where to from here? Currently, for the majority of animals you select for, they will be analysed within breed, in the main. Whether they be Brahmin, Santa Gertrudis, Drought Masters, you go on and on. Um, they're w analyzed within breed as estimated breeding values. But we are definitely moving forward from here. As I said, the Brahmins, as an example, are using genomic information in association with the estimated breeding values. So that is the combination that we've got. And, and I think that that's the place where we need to be aware of uh, what can we do. So moving forward, um, I guess there was two things that I could think of and, and leaving us a bit of time to um, raise a few questions about, well, where to from here? What can we do and what potential is there for, and I'll say me, because it's always nice for us to say someone else should. It's in my shoes or for each of you in your shoes. What can I do to make changes in my herd 
to move forward. So what is there for me as a commercial beef producer to take on board, to use, to apply, because I actually think that the opportunities for us at present are the here and now and they are available to us now. I've identified a number of things that are definitely coming, there's no question, and are not far away. But there are a lot of opportunities for us to use and to apply in our herds at present. Terry's already talked about a range of things in relation to the pasture management and, and so on, and ultimately to the soil health, etc. There are just as many opportunities for us in our livestock management through our bull selection for us to make changes to change the herd into the future. If we make a change, for the better I'll put it, in our bull selection, and it could be for the worse, but if we make it for the positive, for the better, now, how long does that directly affect our profitability? Directly? Ten years, I hear. Fifteen, I hear. Twelve months, I hear. Take those figures that you gave or we talked about at the outset. You use a, a female in the herd for ten years, just to use the usual figure, sort of mate her at two, carve at three, the little ten-year-old, if you want that figure. And we said we use a bull for three years, five years, seven years, whatever the case may be. Let's just take the middle of the road, the five years. In five years' time, before he leaves the place, he's producing daughters that will be in the herd for 10 years. A direct effect for 15 years in that example. If, it's, if we keep the cows till 12 and if we keep them to seven for seven years, there's 19 years. We make less genetic progress, but we've got a warm, fuzzy feeling. We didn't have to go and buy another bull. Um, at the end of the day, our profitability and the direction of our herd for the traits, Terry alluded to the reproductive traits, but that's as much to the growth traits, to the carcass traits, to the temperament, etc., etc., directly affects your profitability and your ability through the breeding objectives to meet target specifications for 15 plus years. We will be having this meeting in 16 years time if we don't apply it today. Because we will have made no more progress because we will be puddling around in that 58% of bull category, the normal distribution, where there is minimal change around the norm. So the ball is in our court, the paradigm is there for us to make change and the opportunity is up to each and every one to use available, currently available information. Apply it. And then we can move on to be ready for when the other changes that are afoot and coming through will be in a position to be able to use those that information when it becomes available to us. So I just thought that I would give a very quick overview of all selection. I appreciate that I did skim through quite a few a f through a quite a few of those slides intentionally because we spend three days around this general area um, and I think that we get a lot more out of some discussions about issues pertaining to a number of those things so if anyone's made any notes or questions that we can address I'm more than happy to um, address those things now for any of you uh, or collectively as a group so have we got any questions around the area of or in the area of bull selection or increasing profitability in our herd. We've got a question down the back. Now all this is uh, very good that you've been saying but some traits come back from four generations back. That's in people and animals 
So this that you got here now, it's um, I I can't see what it's what it's going to do at this moment because you got to you have to go back four generations for some traits, and that's that's in people and animals. Yep. And some of them don't even come from four generations. When we leave home and the baker comes in, that's even one. Yeah. So. But no, there are <laughs> things, like for an example, like I've got a spotted calf at home. Correct. Now, obviously, it's gone back to a gene four generations back. Correct. So we can measure it in the current animal, and we know that is related to outcomes in the progeny. And I just so wanted to make another comment about semen now. Yep. Testing. We had yep. a bullet clam on. Yep. And uh, we had him tested. They said he was no good. Yep. We had more calves on the ground than we knew what to do with from him. So, so what's his comment on that? Yep. Okay. That's a, I'm pleased that you raised that because that's one that invariably comes out with people, with individuals. Um, why should an animal change? We buy an animal, cow bull. Let's focus on the bull. We buy a bull now. Does anything we do to that animal have an effect on its function in life? Or is it the same now and for the rest of time? Is there anything we as commercial breeders do as managers of that animal? Is there anything we do has an effect on it? So there's, there's an example, it gets stressed. Sorry? Diet. So we put, we, our nice term is we let him down. In other words, we starve the guts out of him for a while after he's been on feed and we put him in a paddock gently or otherwise to reduce his body condition to the same as the rest of them. So we let them down in our nice terms. Yes? Any other things we do that has an effect? Vaccinations? So across a range of vaccinations, whether it be tick fever, whether it be three day, so there's a range of vaccinations that in themselves can have an effect. Any other things? <laughs> yeah, so that's 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 the that's the visitor. That's the visitor bit. Um, we won't cast aspersions on on accuracy of the information, but just to recognise that there are a range of management imposed activities, and I'll put the management imposed things that we do on the animals. It can be down to. Uh, subsequent to management, e.g. we bring a bull home, he's not used in the social group that we're used to, he comes in with the rest of the sires that are on our place, they have a blue, they have a fight, he's lame for a few days. Does that have any effect? Yes, it's another one of the stresses that gets into the stresses category and that definitely will have an effect. Conversely, we take a bull from home to a sale yard and they're in a sale yard with other bulls, having a blue, having an effect. Um, another one is, like we said about vaccinations, we can do the right thing with every good intent about vaccinating, pre-sending them to the sale. You know, in other words, they're all vaccinated, ready to go. That vaccination three weeks in advance of the sale could have caused some of the major problems that we've got. So there are a range of reasons. I'm not making excuses. I am just focusing on fact in relation to function and biology. Because what we do know is that the semen and the abnormalities that are there, and then that becomes a question of what are the abnormalities in the percent normal that's available. Are they abnormalities that have an origin within the testicle? Are they abnormalities that have an origin in the storage system, so in the head of the epididymis, body tail of the epididymis or in the ampullae or, or prostate. So where was the semen at what point when it was stressed? What we do know is if a bull has a rise in two to three degrees of body temperature, it will have an effect on the semen in the testicle. So it will end up with a lot of proximal cytoplasmic droplets. It'll have a lot of uh, vacuoles as a result of semen that's in, in, the, seminal, uh, in, the, in the testicle itself seminiferous tubules, but as opposed to semen that's already out of the semen in storage, it has a different effect. It causes a lot of mid-piece abnormalities. So they're the sorts of 
changes that we see depending upon where it was at what point in time. And, and so back to the initial question, is it possible, it is more than possible that a bull sent to a sale yard that has been treated with every good intent in terms of being sent with um, uh, vaccinations and, and treatments could well be low and yet when we get the bull home, if we leave it for quite a few months, he could well recover. What we do need to know is what is the long-term effect? If he was like that, then the issue is I wouldn't buy the bull until I had had the, had the opportunity for a retest. And in fact, the herds that I deal with all do their tests well in advance of any sale so that we know what the semen is like. Is it a genetic abnormality or is it a, an environmental effect? So they're the sorts of uh, opportunities that are there for us to be able to split the genetic uh, effects that are important to us or environmental effects that are the, the uh, are subsequent to some management, I'll put it in that category, environmental and other category, effect imposed on the animal. So that's an, an explanation as to why it would have happened and not unusual. But the issue is, is I wouldn't be testing it at the time of the sale. I would be asking for the information well in advance. Probably a question the opposite to what you're talking about. Uh, in females, have they developed a vaccine yet to do away with Spain? I know they've been working on it. How far have they advanced with that? Have they? Yes, they have. And they've been down that track and it was commercially available, but at a price. And the vaccinations need to be repeated at 14 to 16 weeks, I think was the figure. Um, and they were expensive. I think they were 12 to... 13, 14 dollars per vaccination. And so the beef industry by and large didn't apply it. It was a uh, anti-GnRH uh, gonadotropic releasing hormone vaccination that was done. Michael Docchio from CSIRO was involved in it and a few others. There are a few uh, attempts. It hasn't gone away. They are still looking at it to try and reduce the cost. Um, so it's not entirely gone, but it has some limitations at this point in time. Finan it's got to be financial and, and management, ease of management to apply it, to, to put it in place. Roxanne, you heard anything different to that? No. Yep. Any other questions? Yep. So in relation to, the, correct me if I haven't got it right, in relation to the estimated breeding values um, and across the various, for the various traits, some of them you think are coming from the dam? Yeah, not a, well, some of them that I have, they were... It's not on. Why does it doesn't have? Well, it's not on. Yeah, they are coming from the dam. So... What we do know for certain is that 50% of the genes come from the male and 50% from the female. So there basically is a 50-50 split. Having said that, then within that population, there can be a slightly, because of the recombination of genes, a slightly, slight variation one way or another. But by and large, it is 50-50 from the male, from the female. Then we actually measure the individual animal, and so that gives us a qualification beyond the mid-parent values. When we measure a number of siblings, in, in other words, a number of animals uh, by that same sire, for example, obviously different dams, we can then get the genetic associations so we can improve the accuracy. Now, I then introduce a, another... Hang on. 
that you're going to do. I just lost this. I might have run out of juice. I might have run out of a bit of juice. Yeah, so come down to the individuals. Um, I introduced another term called accuracy, and that is available for all EVVs. And accuracy is a term that is as a percentage, which is about the confidence we can have in the genetic difference in terms of the higher the accuracy, the greater the confidence we can have in that trait, based upon the number of animals that are compared in that comparison group, based upon the correlation with other traits, in other words, like those figures we saw that um, by birth weight is related to 200 day, 400 day, 600 day, etc. So the correlation of traits, that influences the accuracy. And the accuracy increases as an animal gets older and, for example, in a sire, has progeny. So when we get, for example, a bull that's got daughters on the ground and they are producing progeny, we then in turn have increased accuracy even further. So as a general statement, traits early in life will have an accuracy of 30 to 45, 50 percent, but as, the, as a sire has daughters in the herd um, and they have then calves, the accuracy will tend to be between 90 and 95, 98 percent. So it's about the confidence we can have in the measure of the trait related to the number of animals, both the sire and dam and, and the individual animal and then all brothers and sisters. More brothers and sisters that we've got, the higher the accuracy. So if there's only one animal in a comparative group, the accuracy will be lower than if there's a number. Does that answer the question? Any other questions? Ha! <laughs> I'm pleased that that one is raised because it's one that comes up over and over again. The question was is, can we fudge EBVs? Um, I can give you a very quick answer and with total confidence and it would be nicer to actually work through the calculation of an EBV to show you that you cannot. Why? So the EBV, as we said, is let's look at a definition of an estimated breeding value. What is an estimated breeding value apart from a value for a trait? It is estimated performance of an animal compared to all other animals in that group. Right? So it's where an animal sits relative to all others in that, let's say, in your wiener group in cars, it's the performance of one animal at weaning relative to, and if it was a male, to all other males in the wiener group. In that example then is that if we actually put one animal, I'll just use the word heavier or up, what do we do to the average? We shift the average up and if in the group. But if, and so if that's an animal we're interested in, we put it up, but over the whole group, the average has gone up. So relative to the average, we don't make the gain of that total difference that we, let's say we added 10 kilos extra on an animal. We lift the average, depends on how many in the group, but we
it'd be uh, not quite 1.5 kilos. So that in itself, straight away, says that if we could do it, what we thought we had made a big difference in, we only made a difference of 1.5. Next thing is, is that in that group, because most of the breeds that we have one up they put all the others by implication down any other questions getting a bit hot this afternoon <laughs> good on you yep Terry That is a, a national discussion that is ongoing and there has been some comment made that I've been privy to that they would like to give a financial incentive to those herds that are recording phenotype and the genotype that they get a financial benefit and it's not a payment as in under the counter type financial gain, it's getting their genetic analysis at a more consistent price. Um, so yes, some people have done it. Yes, it is broader in the sense that there are a number of government projects, e.g. MLA, CRC, um, uh, the Reponomics project, for example, is being done at a higher research level. Um, so some of the financial uh, associations are coming in nationally funded projects across Australia and across the world, incidentally, New Zealand, the States. Um, so it's coming from a large number of sources, but the ongoing validation will need to be there because of the recombination of genes and because of across breeds. So it will be something that will need to happen. I will, would suggest to you that it will probably happen two ways. The people that just put in some DNA looking for the silver bullet, which is basically by implication what's happening. Uh, they are hoping to get genomic profiles and the probability is they will pay the upper end of the price and the people that um, are providing phenotype with genomic in and supplying DNA information uh, will get it at a very much reduced price. And I can't say too much about what I think is happening but I would suggest it could well be a $10 difference currently um, very close to that figure so uh, there will be incentives in one form or another either out of research project projects and or um, the price of uh, DNA that's being submitted but it does come at a cost there's no question about it and I would have to say publicly that a number of beef producers, uh, yeah, no one in the room here, the general area of estimated breeding values, breeding soundness, genomic information, um, they have put their own private funds in for the betterment of the industry as a whole. We should never lose sight of the fact that 
where we've got to has not got there just because of government grants. It has come at the expense of other beef producers that have done it at their expense for your benefit. Any other queries on that one? Clarification? Anyone else? Uh, well, I say to the vet students, because I handle a few of the fifth years as well and postgraduates, um, the reality is technology should only be kept in the light of what it is. Um, we, can do, we can train a monkey to do a lot of things. AI gets into the same category. Artificial insemination gets into the same category along with in vitro fertilisation. Um, and... and um, Either, either the um, IVF programs or the embryo transfer programs um, still are only as good as the producer's ability to select the male and female union in that program. And in the case of AI, selecting the bull. So if we don't pay attention to the background information on the sire, and on the dam, we will just propagate rubbish. Yeah, that's it in a nutshell, good or bad. So I know, for example, um, to give you a, an example and step out of the IVF, but not for any other reason, um, 